o'clock. Oh, I guess I haven't switched this on, have I? Good morning. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk specifically about water or free water. And essentially, if we regulate free water, that's kind of code for saying that we're regulating osmolarity. Okay? <clears throat> so, we'll divide this into two. In the first hour, we'll look specifically at how the kidney handles water, and in the second, hour, we'll talk about what, what controls it, which of course is primarily ADH. So, case first. Case 17, I believe. Yeah. A 40-year-old man complains with a five-year history of bipolar affective disorder and visits his psychiatrist with complaints of a dry mouth, polyuria, nocturia, and polydipsia. Any, anybody know what polydipsia is? Nobody. Oh, um, yeah, lot, lots of drinking. Okay, uh, nocturia. I think that's obvious. Polyuria, polyurine. Um, so it looks like he's dehydrated. His current therapy includes lithium carbonate, which is still used <coughs> four times daily. His blood chemistry is, and really the only thing that I draw your attention to is the sodium that's 150 milliequivalents per liter. And I, I, since I've kind of given it away anyway, I don't really have a lot to ask you on this. Uh, he is dehydrated, but he appears to be losing water in excess of sodium. Okay. And that's a hallmark of this particular drug. Lithium tends to inhibit ADH's action on the kidney and so impairs the ability to retain free water. And so a very dilute urine is produced in copious quantities. And <clears throat> Remember I showed you a formula the other day that, that, that demonstrates free water deficit, or at least calculates free water deficit? If you calculate, he's about three liters of free water deficient, okay? And so that's about what you want to replace. Okay, any questions on other case? So everybody that has bipolar disorder pretty much is going to be on lithium and that's one of the things that they're asked to look out for. So if we flip the page, we're on page two now, I've got a couple of um, nephrons there. What we're going to look at is how the kidney concentrates urine. And of course concentrating urine is code in physiology for conserving water. Okay, so we sometimes use these silly terms, but really what we mean is we're conserving water. Um, so in man, we can make urine with an osmolarity of about 1,200 milliosmoles per liter. And if you consider that we are normally, most, most of our bodies at 300 milliosmoles per liter, that's kind of a, a, kind of a heroic thing to be able to do. I mean, you know that osmotic forces are very real and so it's actually quite clever to generate urine that has an osmolarity of 300 uh, of 1200 milliosmoles per liter. So you guys probably can do 1200. Um, newborns probably can do six or seven or eight hundred but they develop that that ability within a few days and then older folks 60 plus probably less than a thousand milliosmoles per liter. So the ability to concentrate urine uh, falls with time. <clears throat> so assuming that we're all healthy 20-somethings, let's determine how we do that. Um, oh, I, I, I will make a comment. Although I said that we can only do about 1,200, 
many rat species can actually make urine up to an osmolarity of about 3,000 milliosmoles per liter, which is amazing. Consider that. that uh, and then there are some desert rodents that can actually do six or 7,000 milliosmoles per liter. These animals tend to have long loops of Henle. And so the, the critical thing is the, 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 the nephrons with the long loops of Henle are the ones that are able to concentrate urine and conserve water. So let's start. Um, so the diagram on the left, the way I'll set this up is that this only happens if you have high ADH levels. In, all, in other words, in order to concentrate urine fully, you have to have high ADH levels. And what I'll do is I'll put the osmolarities up on the board. And <clears throat> Do you, do you know, I, I've stood here and told you that there are a lot of numbers and details that I don't really want to, to, to test you on or need you to know. But I find that if you remember the osmolarities that occur, then it actually kind of helps you understand the mechanism. So I, I'm going to do that. So plasma will say is 300. Remember, I'm a physiologist, and so I approximate a lot of things. Uh, 300 in here. And do you remember <clears throat> that a lot goes on in the proximal tubule, but it's, it's is isotonic reabsorption. So the osmolarity, by the time you get to the end of the proximal tubule, is still 300, even though a lot's actually happened. For you guys, you can actually concentrate your tubular fluid to 1,200 by the time you get down to here. And by the time you get back up to here, it goes back down to 100. Interesting. And so it, it's kind of variable here, but I'll put 300. And by the time you produce urine, it gets to be 1,200. So <clears throat> I, I don't think it's a lot to ask there to remember those things. And, and now we're going to have to figure out why that happens. So to give you some kind of hint, one of the things that becomes critical is that This all occurs because in the renal interstitium, that's outside the tubules, you have a vertical osmotic gradient. So in other words, 300 here, 600, 1200, gradually increasing. And it's this interstitial vertical gradient which is responsible for our ability to concentrate urine. And we're going to have to figure out how we can do that with this rather specialized architecture. So um, we're going to go through this a little more later. Let's use this color. So here you reabsorb sodium. But water does not follow it. In other words, you have a part of the tubule that allows sodium to be pumped or reabsorbed, but water doesn't follow. And we, we, we addressed that earlier on. However, in the descending limb, you don't have a lot of iron pumps there, but it is freely permeable to water. So the water tends to come out here. And, and realize that these, these, the ascend and descend are in close proximity. And so basically, the pumping of the sodium out here is, draws more water out of the descending limb. Okay. Um, there is 
actually some passive sodium movement here. And don't worry too much about that. Oh, let me... And I'll come back to that in just a little while. So there's, again, there's no pumping in this thin ascending, but sodium does move. So now you can start to see why the urine or the tubular fluid concentrates from here to here because water is rushing out to meet the sodium that came in over here. And so enough water rushes out that the, 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 the tubular fluid concentrates to 1,200. Okay. Conversely, as you come up from here to here, you're pumping sodium out, but water is not following it. And so if you remove the sodium, it will tend to dilute the tubular fluid and that you remove the sodium from the tubular fluid and that essentially dilutes the tubular fluid so by the time you get back up here you've pumped out enough sodium that you've actually diluted the tubular fluid and this can get down to about 50 quite remarkable so what happens beyond that? Hmm. Okay, so we'll go through on the next page how this actually occurs. But just let's just assume that it does for right now. So hmm. how do these things match? And we'll come back to it. Well, the point is that <coughs> If you can make this interstitial gradient and tubular fluids coming down here, how could you get it such that you extract more water? Well, this is an osmotic, this is osmotically concentrated, so it tends to want to pull water from the collecting duct to meet the concentrated interstitium. So all you have to do is increase the permeability to water and so the water now comes from here to here. Yep. Okay. Let's see if there's anything that I've missed. No, I think we're good. I think we're good. Um, so I won't draw it up, but you see there's a diagram on the right. Yeah, bless you. <laughs> All right, we, we didn't mean to embarrass you. <laughs> That's okay. So the, the diagram on the right is the same nephron uh, where the conditions do not permit the stimulation of ADH. Okay. So in the absence of ADH, you get a very kind of muted uh, action. So the first thing is... In the absence of ADH, this whole mechanism here works at kind of subpar. And I think the, the value it's given here is 120. Yeah. So in other words, this doesn't work as hard, and so by the time you get up to here, it's not quite as dilute. In addition, as 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 this 120, and let me do it in a different color. As this 120 comes through here, if there's no permeability to water, in other words, this is just like a conduit, a tube, if there's no permeability to water, then this will come out here. The water will not be reabsorbed. And with more sodium reabsorption, you can actually get the concentration of urine down to 75. So, and that's only because this is no longer permeable to water, and so whatever water's here just pours straight on out. Okay? Any questions on what we've done so far? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. 
This renal physiology is easy, isn't it? Hmm, yeah, okay. Well, there are some parts of it that are a little more challenging than others. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, um, so I said that, yes, there's more, there's more reabsorption of sodium. And, and does it give a number? Does it give a number at the end of the distal tubule? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, 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 uh, yes, there is some sodium reabsorption in the in, in the distal nephron, and, and and it's significant, but quantitatively, it's a lot less than in the proximal tubule and the loop handling. So yes, sodium reabsorption does occur under both circumstances. Yes, okay. And I think that in that diagram, what's it say? Comes out a is a hundred there, hundred and seventy five. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to rationalise how on earth can we make this gradient, which is basically essentially how we can now extract water. So now we need to figure out how we do that. And on the next page, there's a nice diagram there from. Costanzo, but it's not, it's kind of hard to understand by just going through the diagram. I'll, I'll put up some sort of video in just a minute. Um, so what I want to convince you of by smoke and mirrors is that if we have a sodium pump here that can generate an osmotic gradient from here to here of 200, we can actually make and, and, and also make this water permeable. We can actually multiply this gradient here. Okay? So in other words, a pump that has a power or has the horsepower to pump 200 can actually multiply the gradient down here. Hence countercurrent multiplication. So the countercurrent is significant. And I, I, I've got a video here. Oh, I guess I'll turn on the projectors. So, so we're going to play this for about four or five minutes. Realize it's pretty much an untestable item, but I think it's a decent investment of five or ten minutes just to understand the general concept, okay? Uh, I'm going to use this. This lady has a really weird accent. But I actually think it's... Uh, Uh, did we get an advert? Oh, you can't stop adverts, huh? Yeah. Hi, guys. <laughs> Welcome to Biomed Sessions with me, Ruth. Today we're going to be discussing the use of and the way it helps to concentrate urine in the kidney. The loop of Henley is found between the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule in the nephron. There are actually two types of nephron in the kidney, cortical and juxtamedullary. This has to be a juxtamedullary nephron because of its long loop of Henley and the fact that it dips down into the medulla of the kidney. This type is well suited to the role of helping to concentrate urine. As discussed in my function of the nephron video, filtrate moves through the tubules and eventually exits the collecting duct as urine. But what we want to know is, why does the concentration of filtrate increase as you go further down the loop of Henley? 
Osmolarity is the concentration of a solution, often expressed as milliosmoles per litre. Filtrating the proximal convoluted tubule has an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles per litre, the same as the surrounding interstitial fluid. This means that the filtrate is isoosmotic with its surroundings. But it's a very different story in the new bupendine. Let's zoom in. Let me give you a brief recap of what happened here. But if you want more details, including information about permeability, do go back and watch my previous video. Okay, so in the thick assembly limb, sodium ions are pumped out, and negative ions such as chloride follow, making the medulla a quite concentrated and salty region. Water leaves passively from the thin assembly limb because of the surrounding salty environment, and as the water leaves, the filtrate in the descending limb becomes significantly more concentrated. In addition, the salty medulla is also a major reason why water is able to move passively out of the collecting duct and be reabsorbed back into the blood, thus leaving behind more concentrated urine. But let's pretend that the filtrate is entering the new appendix for the very first time. Naturally, because the filtrate is coming from the proximal convoluted tubule, it will have the same 300 milliosmoles per litre osmolarity and be isoosmotic with the interstitial fluid. However, this situation is not ideal for creating concentrated urine. So in the latter part of the loop of Henley, our aim is to create a difference of 200 milliosmoles per litre between the ascending limb <coughs> and the interstitial fluid. The only way to do this is by pumping out sodium ions. So let's pump. As you can see, the osmolarity in the ascending limb has decreased due to a loss of sodium, whereas in the interstitial fluid, it has increased due to a gain in sodium. And if you look closely at the values, you will see that we have achieved the 200 milliosmol per litre difference, otherwise known as a gradient. But what's happening with the descending limb? Here the filtrate needs to equilibrate meaning that the water will leave passively until the filtrate in the descending limb reaches the same osmolarity as the interstitial fluid. Time to equilibrate. Note, equilibrating does not change the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid. Filtrate moves through the nephron continuously, but I'm going to break this down into steps for you. Let's advance the fluid in the loop of Henley. When brand new 300 milliosmol per litre filtrate enters the descending limb from the proximal convoluted tubule, the filtrate already in the loop of Henley is pushed further along. Bringing back our values for the interstitial fluid, we see that our gradient has been messed up, so we need to re-establish that ideal 200 milliosmol per litre difference. Let's pump out some sodium ions. Okay, although the values vary, there is still a difference of 200 at all levels, so we're content. Now to equilibrate the descending limb with the interstitial fluid and advance the fluid in the loop of Henley a little. Lo and behold, the gradient is messed up again, but we know what to do. Let's pump and establish that 200 milliosmol per litre gradient. Equilibrate to match the osmolarities and advance the fluid. Okay, one more time to get the point across. Our gradient is messed up. Pump out sodium to restore the gradient and equilibrate. Alright, so looking at our values for the interstitial fluid, we can see that the osmolarity increases the deeper you go into the medulla. As all that pumping and equilibrating continues, we eventually reach a maximum concentration of around 1200 milliosmoles per litre. The entire process that I have just described is called countercurrent multiplication. Countercurrent because the filtrate flows in opposite directions in the limbs of the loop of Henley, and multiplication because this countercurrent flow enables the effects of the gradient to be increased, i.e., multiplied. So, in summary, the loops of Henley of juxta medullary nephrons are involved in the process of countercurrent multiplication, which enables the interstitial fluid to become more concentrated. I think we've got it, don't you? Okay. Um, well, before I close it, um, eh, um, obviously she has trouble talking, right? <laughs> but it's actually a, a lot simpler than the other link, and I think it, it, it works pretty well. Um, any questions on, on the video? Okay, good. 
All right, let me close it out then. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, so the question is, so once you reach that osmolarity, maximum osmolarity of 1200, what happens? Realize that with any kind of countercurrent setup like this, the ability, the final concentration is going to depend on how many pumps there are, how much flow there is, and, and everything else. And so it's, it's, it's a combination of the anatomy and the pumping power and, 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 and the num number of pumps. So, um, but it, it is a really good question because um, she said we got to 1,200, and indeed we do. But most people in this field believe that with just pumping sodium, you can probably only get to about six to eight hundred, okay? And, and probably intuitively that kind of makes sense. Um, and it, it may be different in, in, in other animals who have slightly different architecture and, and whatever. But yeah, we believe that we can get to about six, seven, eight hundred. <sighs> but if we get to 1200, do you start to see, remember we talked about osmolarity being a rather significant thing? So, the cells in the, in the medulla, right? And you're exposing them now to a 1200 milliosmol per liter osmolarity. And there are red blood cells going through the vasorector that are being exposed to an osmolarity of 1200. Um, do you think that might have some impact on the cells? Yeah, so if we did it just with sodium and sodium and chloride, there might be an osmotic insult. So what I would like to convince you of is that we actually make the rest of it get up to 1200, mostly with urea. And as you well know, in many cells, urea is re relatively permeable, so it's kind of an ineffective osmol. And so in that way, if we have half of that gradient being urea, then those red blood cells won't be drastically affected as they go through the kidney. So don't know who invented this, but it's a really neat system. Okay? So. Um, See if there's anything else. Oh, I do have a, a, a note here before we go to urea that uh, <clears throat> we, we do trap sodium and chloride and probably other substances too, like ammo anything that's reabsorbed in the loop of Henley, ammonium, maybe um, potassium, um, a whole bunch of things, uh, calcium. So there may be an increased concentration of those those ions too. So let's, let's move over to urea and see how we can actually make urea contribute to that gradient. Okay, so I, I think I'm going to have to draw another nephron. I, I'm going to leave that up deliberately and, and draw another nephron. I can start with, let me start with water and then talk about urea. And I think I can do water over here. We have just been through 
a video that showed us that we can make this gradient. And as I said, a lot of it's sodium chloride, some of it's urea, but just assume that it's 300 to 1200. The crucial thing is that if we can increase the water permeability, which ADH does, in that latter part of the nephron, then this concentrated environment will allow for the passage of water out. And as the water moves out, it, it'll equilibrate with, with, with this 1200 here. Okay, so, well, I, let's make that 1201. It's got, got to go down its gradient, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's the water effect of ADH, the water permeability. Let's now consider urea. Um, uh, let's use uh, blue. Mm. So let's say 100% of the urea, let's just start with 100. Whatever urea is filtered is 100%. By the time you get to the end of the proximal tubule, about 50% has been reabsorbed, and so 50% remains. And I think at the bottom it probably says, what, 110%? So in other words, the urea has been re urea has been reabsorbed. By the time we get down to here, a hundred ten and a hundred and ten percent of what urea is filtered is now here. Okay. So somehow you know urea is somehow getting back into the tubule. Um, as we come through here, this is urea impermeable. Um, how am I going to, okay. And hopefully it says something like 110% is here, right? Does it? Okay, good. Well, it doesn't say. Yeah, it does. Okay. So, <clears throat> what's happening to the urea? Obviously, it's not moving from here to here. Something's happening down here. We've already explained that. So, what happens? ADH then turns on urea permeability selectively in the inner medulla. So with ADH, this now becomes incredibly permeable to urea. And so urea, I said it's 110%, but that's 110% of what was filtered. The concentration is phenomenally high. So back through here, you've got a lot of water that's been reabsorbed. So the concentration of urea has actually got pretty darn high. Okay, and so urea will move into the interstitium, and this is you know part of what's causing the the urea to contribute to the interstitial gradient. There's something else that goes on. This is urea impermeable, but you've got a high concentration of urea here, and it comes in to this permeable part of the, of the descending limb. And so what happens here is that you increase the urea here, you increase the urea here, and you increase the urea here, and it, so basically it's, it's, it's trapping. And that, <clears throat> and that, that kind of explains why you get a greater reabsorption of urea in dehydration, okay? You trap the urea and it doesn't get peed out. 
Okay, so that's urea trapping, and that's how it contributes to the interstitial gradient. See if there's anything else. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let me just add one more thing. So, what does Costanza say? Forty percent. She says 40% actually comes out here. Um, and actually, it's probably rather high in dehydration. Okay, There's actually a lot more reabsorbed in dehydration. If there's ADH around and you're trapping all this urea, you actually probably get well below 40% excreted. Okay, And in fact, a fractional excretion of urea is kind of clinically useful. So if it goes below 35%, it may be indicative of pre-renal azotemia. Ah, we did fractional excretion of sodium, didn't we? Remember, a fractional excretion of sodium that's very low is indicative of pre-renal azotemia. And I know you remember this because you haven't tested out on it yet, yes? You do remember this, right? Okay. One of the problems with fractional excretion of sodium is, you know, some of your patients are sick. That's why you did the test in the first place. Some of your patients may be on diuretics. And fractional excretion of sodium is problematic when you're on diuretics. Okay. So sometimes fractional excretion of urea is used as an additional insight into whether you might have pre-renal azotemia. Okay. Because we know it's trapped. We know it's trapped when the kidneys are working well. <clears throat> and so anything below 35% would be considered a dehydrated state. Okay. Good. Easy. All right, let's do one more thing before we take a break. Let us look at vasorectal. We're now on page five. So let me clean this up a little bit. Um, so you know that the efferent arteriole comes out and there's peritubular capillaries, and this is where more than 90% of the blood flow is. There are also, in the long loops of Henle, these vasorecta. Which dip down here. Now realize, <clears throat> we work really hard to make this medullary interstitial gradient. Okay, Wouldn't it be crappy if we just had a blood vessel where the arterial came in here and the venous came out here, you'd basically wash the whole gradient away if you had any kind of real blood flow. A couple of things with vasorecta. The blood flow is very, very small. In fact, only, only about 1% of the renal blood flow actually gets down to this point. Okay. The second thing is that because of this specialized architecture, it helps us preserve the gradient. And let me use that diagram that's on that page. I shouldn't have done that. That looks scruffy, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. So here's the vasorector. Blood coming in here. So blood comes in at 300. And this is 1,200 down here, this is 600, and this is 300 here. So as blood comes in, remember, this is a capillary, just like any other capillary. And so water and solutes can move in and out of the, uh, in and out of the vessel. 
And so as it comes into a more concentrated environment, there will be a tendency for solutes to go this way and for water to go this way. <clears throat> So as you come down here, it basically equilibrates. So by the time you get down to here, blood in the capillary is 1,200. About 50% of it's urea, and about the other 50% is other solutes. So the red blood cells are happy. So now we've got blood at 1,200 that migrates back through into a relatively dilute environment and so the reverse happens. So as you come into a more dilute environment the water wants to go this way and the solutes want to go that way. And so all I am doing here is demonstrating that because of the specialized architecture to some extent you minimize the washing out of that gradient that we worked so hard to get. And this is, um, this is often just referred to as the countercurrent exchanger. There's nothing multiplied, there's no active processes, it's just a capillary where salts and water move passively into and out of the capillary. Okay? Straightforward? Okay. So, any questions before we take a break? I think it's exciting stuff, even if you guys don't. Okay, let's take a break. I guess we'll start again about 10, a little after 10.50. Uh, we won't run late today. Okay.